Um, good afternoon, everybody. So this is William Santos from ABI Electronics here in uh, Sunny Barnsley in Yorkshire. Um, first of all, thanks very much for uh, joining us in this uh, webinar co-hosted by two, and some may say unlikely, allies, the Restart Project. The Restart Project is a London-based charity that promotes repair skills in communities. And we, ABI Electronics, you know, as I mentioned, we are a Yorkshire-based uh, company that manufactures, designs and manufactures advanced diagnostic and component level repair equipment for industries like defense, biomedical, transport, aerospace, manufacturing, and so on, and so on. okay? Um, a few things bring us together today, um, and, and one of them, or two of them, potentially, being the underlying belief that our society and economy uh, need to value maintenance and repair and for the economical and environmental benefits that they bring, and an urgent concern for what the next weeks and months will bring us during this uh, pandemic in this country. Okay, so um, this is just me, just giving a quick introduction on myself and, and ABI. I'd like to ask uh, Ugo to um, introduce uh, Restart, please. Hi, I'm Ugo Valauri from the Restart Project. Uh, here in the UK, we've heard so much uh, over the last few weeks about the need to manufacture new ventilators. But we'd like to hear more discussion also about how can we maintain and service all COVID-19 related medical equipment, given that it will be put under, under unprecedented use in the coming weeks and months. Even the new ventilators and the CPAP uh, machines continuous positive airway pressure for those not in the known that are being manufactured right now by manufact new manufacturers like Dyson and Mercedes Formula One, they all will need to be repaired and maintained in the long run. In the spirit of learning and exchange, we'd like to explore one big question today. Are we prepared to repair equipment to save lives during this pandemic? Seen from outside, the medical and biomedical field, but based on both negative and positive experience we bring from other sectors, we genuinely wonder. Perhaps we hope today we will put many of our doubts and worries to rest. So uh, to get started, uh, uh, this is the format we will adopt and hope it's uh, familiar for those of you uh, joining webinars. We will ask each of our panelists to speak for five minutes, and then we will have a Q&A in the last 20, 25 minutes. We are very grateful for two of our speakers who come from the medical sector and have taken time out to share their experience more widely today. Dr. John Sandam from the EBME and Dr. Helen Mies from The Care Machine. We'll hear from them first and ground the conversation as best as we can. And then we'll hear from William again from ABI Electronics and hear what transferable experience from other sectors might help in a crisis situation. Then Olivia Webb from iFixit will tell us all about their crisis mobilization to assemble as many official service manual as possible for medical equipment, starting from the ventilators. And to wrap it up, Jim Killock from the Open Rights Group will bring to light some of the legal barriers to repair and reuse of medical equipment. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, if you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, uh, please do so using the chat. We'll ask presenters to respond at the end if the question is simple to answer, or if not, we will save it for the Q&A at the end. We'll give a little reminder to panelists on time just to make sure we can stick to the hour. Please know we are recording this webinar to share with a larger audience afterwards. And without further ado, uh, let's introduce uh, Dr. John Sand first. John, the floor is yours. Don't know if John can hear us. John, um, can you hear us?
perhaps just someone. Oh. John is on mute at the moment. Um, uh, perhaps type it in the chat. Yeah, see. John, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Ah, uh, we can now. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I've been working in the medical industry for thirty-five years, and for the last twenty years, I've been working as um, director or chairman. Of it. I've been chairman of the EBM website for twenty years, and a doctorate in medical diseases management and policy. So I've got a lot of experience. I also ran the largest uh, medical equipment maintenance company. TBS GB Limited, six years. Um, I think the biggest issue that we're facing at the moment to repairing medical equipment. Uh, John, John, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, John. Can you, can you try to speak a bit closer to the microphone so that we can all hear you? Thank uh, you. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, it's better now. Yes, thank you. Um, so what I was saying is, is that there's an unprecedented number of devices that will be put into service in these new hospitals. For example, at the XL Centre, the Nightingale Hospital at the XL, you're looking at 50,000 pieces of equipment. Um, if you look across the whole of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, you could multiply that by four. So you could be looking at 200 different pieces of medical equipment. In a general acute hospital, normally you would have one technician looking after potentially around 1,000 items of equipment. So now, where are these 400 extra engineers going to come from that can look after 400 pieces of equipment? They, they just don't exist. So what we have to do is look at alternative ways of maintaining and repairing these equipments across the field hospitals and across the NHS hospitals because there's going to be, there will be a lot of engineers that are going from the NHS hospitals into these field hospitals. Uh, the, the the way it's working at the moment is it's all commissioning work. So there's, there's also an upfront sort of deluge of work for all of these field hospitals. And uh, the commissioning work is, I would say, more important at the moment than considering the repairs. Just trying to commission over the next, say, eight to 12 weeks, 200,000 items of medical equipment is no mean task. Um, so uh, I think that sort of sets the scene. So I, I, I think uh, with regards to carrying out this repair, it doesn't necessarily have to be biomedical engineers that do this. I'm sure Helen would agree with me that there are other people who are capable of carrying out minor repairs and also on the low-risk equipment commissioning the, uh, as well. Going on to your point, Hugo, about sharing service manuals and spare parts. I think that's also important. But I have seen um, some companies that are now sharing drawings and sharing service manuals. So I think there is a slight trend that I've seen in the market that sharing is happening. I think that, that that's where I'll leave it for now because I know that we're, everybody wants to say something. So I'll stop now. Over to you, Hugo. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, John. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Helen Mees as a founder and managing director of the CARE machine. And uh, we'll hear particularly from Helen about an initiative to bring together techs and engineers uh, as supporters uh, in key hospitals for maintenance and repair. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you fine, thank you. Excellent. So I'm gonna follow on from, from what John said, and he, he's absolutely right that there are um, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of pieces of equipment that are going into the hospitals um, over the next few weeks. Uh, and those pieces of equipment are gonna need um, huge amounts of effort to, to maintain them. Um, I've been very fortunate over the last uh, week or so to be part of the um, uh, clinical engineering team at uh, Nightingale who have been trying to make sure that those engineers are available to make sure the equipment is uh, serviced. And what I've been doing as an external 
person because I'm not a clinical engineer myself, but I am a, an engineer by profession, um, is uh, work with uh, many of our engineering institutions across the UK to, to recruit volunteers to support the clinical engineering community uh, within the NHS because they are going to be flat out dealing not only with the equipment, but also working alongside their clinical counterparts with patients. And so they're going to need engineers to support them. So we've put together a, a team um, so far just covering uh, London, Manchester and Birmingham. Um, and I'm very, very happy to say that um, within the space of 24 hours of putting that call out, we have had 622 respondents uh, to, to that voluntary. Um, scheme. So we've got a lot of engineers who have volunteered um, and these are people who are um, professionally trained and qualified uh, and who will have the ability to, to help and support um, the, uh, the servicing, the maintenance of, of these devices over the next few weeks. So that's, that's really what I've been doing um, and it really backs up what, what John has said in, in terms of just how much um, this technology will need to be supported and how many engineers we're, we're going to need. Uh, our next challenge is to focus on um, the rest of the country uh, and hopefully in the next uh, couple of days we'll be recruiting engineers to, to help at other field hospitals across the UK. Great. Thanks, Helen. Uh, next up is William who is Head of Communication at ABI Electronics, all the way from Brazil. He has 20 years experience of helping aerospace, rail transport, energy, biomedical and defense organization discover the benefits of repairing instead of replacing electronic circuit boards. Creator of the Repair Don't Waste movement, William Defense, that teaming up with the like-minded people in business and industry creates job opportunity across the world and advances the understanding of how electronics work and what people should do when it does. William, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Hugo, and thanks, everyone. So, um, well, here at ABI Electronics, we design and manufacture electronic diagnostic equipment that makes um, PCB repairs not just possible, but um, they, they can be, be carried out by technicians, engineers quite quickly. Okay, and our, our systems are, are widely used by the MOD, by aerospace organizations, um, the, the, uh, the, you know, the manufacturing industry, biomedical including. And so what we've been, what we have been um, working on for the last, you know, two to three weeks is um, defending what we call a triple approach to the uh, crisis. Yes, we need to build new ventilators, but we also need to look into recommissioning old and repairing you know new and existing uh, ventilators and other medical equipment throughout the crisis uh, we have the technology we are uh, we have reached out to uh, several trusts several engineers biomedical engineers up and down the country um, uh, we've been trying to explain what uh, our technology can do in this case we have been we are supporting uh, ourselves as a business by offering our technology at heavily subsidized prices we're offering free free of uh, free of charge training as well um, but one big problem that we've uh, been encountering is um, everywhere every biomedical engineer that i spoke to working for the nhs has said that yes you know our abi's technology is precisely what is needed at the, uh, at the moment because it can help biomedical engineers repair uh, down to PCB and component level quite quickly, as it happens in other industries, in other sectors. Um, however, their hands are tied by regulation and, and their hands are tied by liability regulations that uh, basically stop them from doing so. So this is something that we would like to uh, potentially discuss um, during the seminar. and. Um, um, potentially hear from from other participants uh, their 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 thoughts on that. Uh, we've been uh, taking this matter up with the government, and, um, and we will see what what's going to happen in uh, in the in the next uh, coming days. Okay, back to you, Ubu. Great, and apologies for the slight glitch. <laughs> um, next, uh, I will. Uh, 
pass it on to Olivia Webb from iFixit, who's probably clinging to a cup of coffee right now, all the way from California. We're very grateful for you to be able to join us at such an early time. Your site, iFixit, is a company that sells uh, repair tools and spare parts to people so that they can fix their stuff. But right now, they're also helping create the world's biggest archive of repair documentation and specifically to our interest right now on medical equipment service manuals as well. Uh, Olivia, please tell us more. Thank you. So, yeah, I come from iFixit. We're an online repair manual, and we have just been, over the last 16 years, um, creating repair documentation for normal consumer electronics like iPhones, iPads, MacBooks. Um, and we have been hearing for years from um, hospitals and technicians that the manufacturers of these medical devices are restricting the repair information and they're making it very hard to access. So when we learned about um, what was happening with this virus and the things that people were coming up against most often, we knew that ventilators would be really heavily used and um, that means that they were going to be breaking very often and that they would need to be fixed. Um, so we started thinking about what would happen if a technician at a hospital got sick and couldn't repair any of the devices in his hospital, or, excuse me, or if, like you said, there's only one technician in the hospital and they were overwhelmed, um, or if they're volunteers. Um, we don't want them to spend their time looking for manuals or trying to get access to the manuals they need to do these repairs. Their time is going to be very precious because they're going to be so overwhelmed. So we decided to compile all of the manuals to repair all of the ventilators that we could identify. Um, we reached out to our community on our website and we've had um, a staggering number of volunteers reach out to us and help us find manuals, help us identify the manuals that we need to compile, the, the machines that we need to find manuals for and the manufacturers that are being difficult. Um, they're all uploaded on our site. We're still looking for more. Um, once we have them all, we, we've been organizing them on our site and we're going to start creating guides for them the way that our other guides um, look on our site so that anybody can get on to this resource and find the ventilator that they need to fix and just see exactly step by step what they need to do to fix the ventilator so that anybody, technician or not, can help repair these devices. Um, once that's done, we're going to translate those guides into a lot of languages with our army of volunteers so that anybody can fix them anywhere they are. Um, and then we're going to move on to other medical devices as well. So we're not just focusing on ventilators. But that's kind of an idea of what we're doing and how we're trying to help in this crisis. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Olivia. And uh, some of the issues are probably uh, familiar uh, to Jim uh, Kellogg's as well, a company wanting to keep repair documentation closed, private. Uh, Jim is the director of the Open Rights Group, a UK-based organization that campaigns on intellectual property rights, which are used to keep repair documentation unlawful, to copy and even to make repairs unlawful to perform. Jim. Hi there. So, yes. Uh, so. Our, our concern generally is uh, around free expression and privacy. Those are usually the reasons that we get involved in looking at intellectual property regimes and the consequences of them. Obviously, uh, in this situation, the consequences uh, can be met much, much greater. Um, so our understanding here really is around uh, a set of technologies called uh, digital rights management. and the thing here is that you know, you'll be familiar with the sort of restrictions on repair and accessing things like iPhones. Uh, you'll know about uh, Kindles locking you into ebooks and things like that. Um, but digital rights management is spreading um, into many other sorts of areas of technology, and that includes things like cars, uh, agricultural equipment like tractors, uh, and medical equipment. Um, and essentially what is happening is that the, the copyright law has restrictions on evading what they call technical protection mechanisms. So 
technical protection mechanisms um, are there to stop people copying, right? As as with your Kindle or whatever, this stop you from making unlicensed copies, usually of copyright books and films and so on. Um, but what has happened over the years is that the idea of software, because software can be copyrighted, the idea has been to embed software into devices, and that can be any kind of medical equipment, and it does, I believe, exist in, in some sorts of medical equipment. Um, the software is embedded, there is copyright on that software, restrictions are then placed, technical restrictions are placed on um, accessing that software or altering it or replacing it with the result that the only person that can really access and control the, 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 the lifespan of the machine is the vendor and um, this is often then locked in you know this is also can be locked into things like um, diagnostics information the software might be fundamental to reporting um, when the device is kind of needs repairs or is getting faulty that kind of thing um, or indeed patient diagnostics. So all of those sorts of things might then go to cloud services. Again, the only way you can access that information and make full use of the equipment is through those cloud services. So um, that is all backed up by law. So copyright law says you can't interfere with this. And if you are doing, you're breaking laws. And that makes it very difficult for people to even attempt to fix these things because disclosing information around fixing technologies that are restricted in that way is a criminal offense and can land you in jail so most famously um unencryption methods for dvds for instance uh somebody in sweden i think it was one well, certainly um scandinavia um worked out how to decrypt dvds they published that information and they were basically threatened with long jail sentences should they ever tra travel to the USA. Uh, they would face trial and probably end up in prison. Um, so, you know, the same situation would exist if DRM is applied to medical equipment. Somebody starts working out how to get around the DM DRM and replace it. They are breaking the law um, in most circumstances and um, they could face jail. So, you know, in this circumstance, the right thing to do is, is for the companies to release information around how to remove that DRM should it be necessary um, or to simply remove the restrictions themselves. So these could be important issues depending on the particular bit of equipment um, and, 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 and what kind of vendor you have and what sort of vendor um, they are, whether they're responsible or not. Obviously, because of the sheer necessity of, of, of repair and access to the full capabilities of machinery and equipment. Um, one would hope that people do act responsibly, but um, you know, it's very hard for, for me to know exactly um, whether that is happening. And it's interesting to hear that even in the case of repair manuals, uh, companies are sometimes resistant. Um, that doesn't bode well. I guess they're looking to the problems that might flow from this in a few years if people have access to all this information, you know, will they lose certain benefits and market share? It'd be interesting to explore that problem and know more about whether these sorts of problems are very concrete appearingly, concretely appearing um, in this arena. I should say the other aspect of this is that often international treaties back up these restrictions, which is even more uh, annoying and complex to deal with because uh, we, we, we're in for a long fight actually to try to get some of these things dealt with. In Europe though, there are a few exceptions around research and so on, which, which are helpful potentially in this regard. Thanks, Jim, very helpful. So we got quite a range of perspectives uh, going straight from the medical equipment from to the spare parts and the repair manuals and legal aspects around uh, keeping products in operation and uh, uh, there's all sets of questions that this uh, brings up and uh, we would like to uh, ask everyone uh, to contribute questions uh, via the chat and we're trying to split uh, questions into three uh, key aspects. Uh, one is around people, uh, 
the other is around so the capacity uh, to perform repairs and who should be doing them. Uh, second one is around spare parts and the supply chain. And the third around documentation diagnostic. But keeping in mind that legal, regulatory and liability related issues will probably run through these three uh, themes. Um, I have a first question on uh, people related matters, and that's for Helen. So I'm wondering, uh, what are the plans to train the uh, huge number of volunteer engineers that uh, have expressed their interest to help? Uh, that's a very, very, very good question, actually. Um, there is a huge program going on right now uh, to prepare the engineers for, for this work. Um, and that's not only the volunteer engineers, but actually the clinical engineers that are, are going to be doing this. This is an unprecedented situation that we have. Um, and whilst uh, our clinical engineers are, are exceptionally well trained, um, we this is a, a, on a scale that's never been seen before, um, whether that's in the UK or anywhere else in the world. So um, they are undergoing, those that are, are going to the sites at the moment, particularly down at uh, Nightingale, uh, are going through very strict um, training programs right now to, to bring them up to speed with what's going to be needed of them. Um, and that's not just on the, the equipment side, but that's on the, the process and the, the management of patients as well. Um, and then once they are in place, then um, the volunteer engineers who will then come in to fill some of the, the gaps um, that, uh, that appear in that process uh, will then go through similar training programs uh, to ensure that they're at the right standard and they understand um, the requirements that are, are placed upon them. Alongside that, they will obviously be managed in the most appropriate way as well. So all of these volunteers will be, be in small teams. They will be managed by trained clinical engineers um, who, who will then supervise them to ensure that they uh, can carry out their jobs. So, uh, so there's a very strict protocol, a strict process going on uh, to make sure that they are uh, trained to the highest standards. Uh, great. Obviously, there's uh, a key question that everyone has seemingly tried to give an answer to, and probably John can help us uh, make sense of the different claims and numbers that we've been hearing. So are we going to short in terms of ventilators? Uh, in in the UK in the end and and linked to that um, we've heard quite a bit of discussion around the potential to reuse or bring back into use uh, the commission equipment equipment that is no longer in active use and there might be some barriers related to making sure that it works again uh, maintenance and support have you come across any reliable numbers um, and of the equipment that is, is in that condition? And is there any sort of database across the UK combining all the information around all the equipment that could be reused uh, but isn't yet? Um, I'll start off with your first question. Can you hear me better now I've put the headset on? Oh, yes, it's much better. Thank you. Okay. Well, with regard to the number of ventilators, um, it's a bit of a moving target. So it's looking like we don't need as many ventilators as we first thought, but there's still a lot of ventilators needed. The reason for this is because they're finding um, that CPAP units, which are not ventilated, so they, they're continuous positive airway pressure devices. They keep the lungs inflated. Um, they, can, they can end up with a better recovery than use a ventilator, uh, whether that's a non-invasive or an invasive ventilator, and allowing the people to use their own respiratory function to breathe as much as possible. So there's been a switch to some degree to using more CPAP devices. Now, these are the devices which are easily available and easily manufactured. So to answer your question, do I think there will be a shortage of ventilators? If you include CPAPs in that, I don't think there will be. Um, the second part of your question was around um, secondhand ventilators. Now, when I was at Nightingale last week, 
Um, I did see secondhand equipment coming in. So there, I think there will be a mix of equipment being used. And I've had um, equ equipment offered to me via the website uh, because we had a company called MTS Health who offered to put a database together. But there hasn't really been much uptake from that from, uh, from what I can see. And what seems to be the case is that uh, the manufacturers, especially big manufacturers like JCB, uh, Mercedes, you know, a lot of these what are industrial sized manufacturers are stepping up to the mark to make very basic uh, CPAP machines and ventilators. Um, I think they will be able to make them in the sorts of volumes that we need. Now, there are secondhand devices which have been kept in the country. So I've been speaking to people like the British Medical Auctions and Hilditch who are auction companies that specifically auction medical equipment, and they are holding onto stock for the UK markets. And in fact, a lot of that stock has been shifted into areas, hospitals and um, the Nightingale for, for use. Um, I know that 250 beds arrived from an auction company last week into the Nightingale. Uh, I was there when they arrived. Unfortunately, some of them uh, are not suitable for use because they're damaged. So there is also a need to have trained technicians there, not just for ventilators, but beds and other devices. Mm. I think going back to what Helen was saying, you don't need trained technicians for everything. The other thing that you need to do is to maximize the efficiency of your workforce by minimizing the traditional planned maintenance and repair maintenance functions that would traditionally be done. If you can do that, then you can take an hour job and take it down to 10 minutes by not following the manual. So although Olivia was saying she can make manuals available, if you actually follow the manual, what you can end up doing is instead of commissioning the hospital in three weeks, it could take three months. And um, so I think that there have to be corners cut safely. New procedures have to be written. They have to be written um, in a way that keeps patients safe but also maximize the speed. And that's what I was advising on last week when I was at the, uh, at the Nightingale was how can we create a speedy way of getting this equipment into these new field hospitals? Um, so with regard to uh, the ventilator numbers, do I think there will be enough in the UK? Yes. Do I think there will be enough worldwide? No. Um, that's partly because we're a very rich country and we can, we can put the resources in to do that. Now, with regard to the database, do I think a database of all second-hand equipment will be made? No. Um, I would love there to be, and I've volunteered to help with that, but I don't think that, in, in, in reality, I don't think that will happen. I think the government and um, the supply chain people are more interested in getting hold of things as quickly as they can. And also, for commissioning, it's better to have something that's brand new. As I was just mentioning with the beds, if it arrives and it's come out of an auction house and a lot of them are damaged, the first thing you have to do is then put a resource to repair them. If it arrives and it's in a box and the first thing you have to do is unpack it and it comes out of the box brand new, 99% of the time you can put it straight into use safely with some minimal checks, you know, switch it on. Does it work? Yes, it does. Put it on the patient. Um, so you can't do that with secondhand equipment. You have to do a more in-depth check to make sure it's safe. Whereas you would assume that if it's just come out of the factory, it is safe. Um, so, uh, so that was vents, the database, and reusing medical equipment. Yes, medical equipment is being re reused, must be reused. Um, it's also not just about the field hospitals. I was speaking to staff at various hospitals where they're, they're um, reusing anaesthetic machines uh, as ventilators to create ventilators in theatres, which is also interesting. Um, so there, there are different ways you can do this to look after these patients. So that I think I, I think I answered all your questions. There you go. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very helpful and in a way also some positive news, which these days is quite rare. Mm. Um, I've got Ugo, if, yeah. if I may, I've got go a ahead, uh, go question here from uh, from one of the uh, the participants. Uh, I've got a question from from Matt Fletcher. I'm just going to read these back to everyone. Um, having quite a few years experience in repairing industrial and medical equipment, and I'm talking the electronic parts here, it's very often component failure in the power supplies and our screens and switches, etc., or the user interface that break down. 
uh, repair to these do not alter the product or do we um, do not alter the product or do we need to get involved in the software it, it, well it doesn't have to alter the product and does not uh, 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 doesn't mean that we need to get involved in the software we've been repairing for GE healthcare and Siemens medical on this basis for quite a while is the legal argument more of a fear to avoid repair rather than just doing it so that's a very interesting question here from from uh, Matt, thank you, Matt, for the question. Uh, everyone else, if you want to keep the questions going, please. Uh, I'm just going to add, you know, or, or comment on on, on uh, um, uh, Matt's question here. Um, we 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 very much agree to your, you know, with with the point, uh, Matt. Uh, I think there are um, many different systems that uh, don't, you know, the, repairing them wouldn't really um, compromise the product itself or you know the patient and 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 what what we could do what we could achieve if we did have um a culture in this country especially when it comes to uh, the nhs uh, I, I was speaking i spoke to us you know biomedical engineers up and down the country operate you know working from different uh, locations and trusts and uh, i i was i was really shocked when when one of them said that uh, they stopped repairing pcbs doing electronic level component pcb level repair decades decades ago and um and, and this is this is something you know when 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 we're now in time of crisis we're seeing a situation where uh, they are going for the manufacturers for spare parts because there are lots of uh, uh, equipment that has been uh, um, marked to be scrapped and they are trying to get those back, you know, uh, back to the front line. And the manufacturers are quoting months for the spare parts to come through because they are overloaded. And, and these engineers, they cannot even attempt to do, you know, to uh, repair those electronics, the, the, the onboard electronics, because of the um, fear of, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the legal or regulatory liabilities in place. So, so this is um, this is something that we've been trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a part of the the problem that we're trying to resolve. We can, as a as a business here, as a company, technology manufacturing company, we can definitely address those issues. We could really empower these engineers and technicians and really help them do component level, PCB level fault finding and repair quickly. And I think that that are. Uh, uh, you know, very good people, well-trained people. Some of them, you know, they share some of, the experience, of their experiences with me and they really are, they are very passionate about electronics and they can definitely do a very good job if given the tools and the training. But we definitely need the legal part to uh, sort of be sorted in, and they, they need to have that, that backing as well. So th this is my, my, my comment on Matt's uh, question. But if perhaps... John, Helen, or, or anyone else, if, it, if you'd like to add any comments. So back to his main question is, is the legal argument uh, uh, more of a fear to avoid repair rather than just doing it? Anyone else want to uh, comment on that? Yeah, I'd like to add something to this. Um, I was interested uh, that, uh, Olivia, you're putting um, service manuals up on iFixit. I'll be interested to come and see those. Jim, uh, restrictions on repairs. One of the things, um, as somebody who has been chief exec of a very large maintenance company, we do do electronic repairs. We do replace power supplies, uh, even uh, you know, replace components within power supplies, things like that. So the more simple repairs, the repairs that are not normally done, uh, very rarely seen, are you know, like uh, repairing the main circuit boards rather than the power supplies. With regard to the, the, the things that cause real difficulty are not usually the, um, the main circuit boards. They're usually quite reliable. It's more around software. And if there's a software issue, a lot of companies will not give us um, the documentation or the diagnostic tools, which is new, usually a laptop, to be able to get in to do any diagnostic tests without paying a lot of money. And I'll give, uh, I won't give the example of a company, but I'll give examples of cost. So um, a particular anesthetic manufacturer uh, insists on you buying their laptop, so you pay for their laptop, their, their service software, so you pay for their service software, and then an annual license fee for having the service software. And the three things together cost more than having the service contract in the first place. So there's no point in trying to do it yourself because they've put so many 
um, obstacles in the way so that their own technicians and their own income is protected, that it's, it's not worth it with some companies. That's generally the companies where they have high risk equipment, such as ventilators or imaging equipment. On the lower end, they're not interested in fixing their equipment on the whole, so they'll supply you with the software. They'll supply you with so cheaper items. So as the items go up in cost, as soon as you get into capital costs, things over £5,000, you find it becomes more and more difficult as the items get more and more expensive because the companies try to put obstacles in the way to stop you repairing them. Now, as somebody who started out as a technician, I know that I can fix anything. And I know that any engineer can fix anything with the right tools and the right software and test equipment. And so it would be great if legally we could get around that, which I, I you know, as somebody who's been chief executive and managing director of a few different companies, um, I've never been able to get around that. They always have a way in Europe of stopping that, although I know they've, they've done it in the States. So I'd be interested to hear whether Jim yeah, you, you've got any solutions for us with regard to that. I'll stop there. Thank you. I don't know that I've got uh, solutions as such. Um, I think there's certainly with, there are, um, it depends exactly what it is, but I think if, if you're talking about reverse engineering software, then I think there are uh, legal reasons that you can do that. I mean, there is certainly no restriction on on, on that, as I understand it, because uh, you have to be able to um, make software interoperable. So in more mundane fields, perhaps where there's larger user bases, it's quite common for people to uh, reverse engineer APIs and other such things where, um, you know, people have an interest. You know, so people have, have worked out, the, you know, spent, spent a number of years, for instance, working out how Microsoft Outlook and other such things uh, might be used on a server level. People didn't want to use Microsoft Service all the time. Um, but of course, a lot of people are interested in uh, email servers, I guess. And the, so the question is whether there are enough people who have enough interest and time to uh, reverse engineer the pieces of equipment you're talking about. Um, but I think from, from a point of view of software, that shouldn't be an issue. Where you get more of a problem, I think, is where they've placed technical restrictions on accessing the software, uh, because then you may be breaking the law to even attempt it. So, you know, there, there can be some gray areas, but I, I think, you know, fundamentally that ought not to be the case. It's really interesting to hear that example because it, it absolutely shows how the technology is being abused, right? Because, I mean, that, this is, you know, you bought the thing and now you're being told you're not allowed to access uh, the, the, the bits of the machine which actually tell you how to sort out the problems. And that, that is wrong, but also parallels like that exist uh many other places um you know car manufacturers if, for instance is going the same way um combination of software technical restrictions um licensing uh warranty all of this is sort of put in the way of people uh repairing cars so effectively you know if you buy a car um you know you're pretty much renting it really you're not really owning it because the minute you try to interfere with it you're avoiding various warranties um, and basically you, you lose all, all, all possibility of, of, of help. And of course, sometimes of course, uh, you know, with domestic equipment, it gets even worse. So you try to interfere with it and the, and the machines just uh, become uh, un, unusable. And I'd hope that doesn't happen in the medical field, but you never know. Um, I think in a situation like this, this equipment should just be given out, right? The point is, where's the bottleneck? How do we sort it? One thing, for companies to try to overcharge and make a profit that they shouldn't, which is what you're describing. But in a situation like this, things have to be repaired. So I think we need, at this point, is more less of a le legal thing and more of a moral pressure thing. Who's doing the bad things? Who is actually trying to get in your way? Shame them. Um, and there should be, at this point, I think it's public shaming if companies are doing what you describe. And it's concerning to think that a lot of the equipment that is really necessary, like ventilators, is subject to, to arrangements like this. So I think that's something that really needs to be made public and we need to explore that. But, um, what, where you can, but yeah, it's, I, I think from a software perspective, it may, may not be illegal. It may be perfectly reasonable to reverse engineer this. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, just for to, to this, um, I wonder, John, based on your experience, uh, um, 
and my beta Helen can actually bring her perspective too. Much of the equipment, medical equipment, is actually under service contract. And are biomeds actually allowed to repair these uh, themselves in a crisis situation like now, like sort of a force majeure? Um, I would say yes. I'd say there's no legal reason why biomeds can't maintain equipment. The reasons why they normally can't maintain equipment is because the manufacturers won't supply the spare parts for maintaining or repairing the equipment, or they won't they won't provide the software, as I just said. Right. But in in reality, the majority of faults. I've done some research on this, and the majority of faults are very simple. So you could say that ninety percent of faults could be could be repaired by um, a reasonably able technician. Unfortunately, that's not always the case because, um, especially on, like, as I was saying, higher cost equipment, they put a lot of blocks in the way. One of the blocks is training, so trying to get training for your technicians. Even if you have a technician that's trained, so you've had somebody that's been trained. So I've employed like Siemens technicians, for example. They are not allowed to cascade their training. Uh, so Siemens will not um, certify a technician that's been trained by a previous Siemens technician. And also uh, other companies like GE Healthcare, I'll name and shame here, they, they will um, offer training and they'll charge you a lot of money for it, but they will insist on refresher training. Uh, now, if somebody's working on something and they, they look at some, you know, they look at a piece of equipment, they, they repair it on a regular basis, I, I have um, no reason to send them on refresher training. They can read, they can read the service manual the only reason for refresher training, if something has changed on the equipment, uh, it's been upgraded, for example, then they need refresher training. So refresher training for the sake of it is something else that manufacturers do, not just GE, but other manufacturers as a way, I think, of getting more money. Um, so I think that biomeds can, or clinical engineers can do repairs. Uh, they can repair the majority of equipment, give them the right training and tools. Uh, I'll, over to you, Helen. I, I don't think there's much I can add to that, John. Um, I mean, that, that pretty much covers it. I, I would have said the same thing. You know, um, I, I think that there is a there is an issue, I think, within the manufacturing industry um, whereby it's, it's very easy for them to produce technology, which in, in relative terms is quite cheap. But where they make their money is by exactly what John says, is by requiring you to go through training, requiring, you know, keeping information to themselves so that it means that you're reliant on them to to support the the maintenance um of that that equipment so i think that's something certainly that's gone on for many years i don't think that's something that's new um I, it, it happens in all industries not just the medtech industry um and and that's really where where manufacturers have made made money uh, over the years, uh, a, a photocopier is is a prime example of that that situation. Um, you know, you can buy a photocopier relatively cheaply, but if it breaks down, you've got to have somebody come in from the company to fix it, um, and that costs money. And so it's the same the same situation uh, with medical devices. Um, so I think that's something that needs to be addressed. And I, th I think it, in these sort of situations where equipment is being used, probably. Um, on a faster turnaround than it would normally be under normal operating circumstances. The engineers have got to be able to, to fix that equipment uh, and they can't fully be reliant on the uh, the manufacturers to do that. Otherwise, we're, you know, we're going to put patients at risk from that point of view. And can I just add uh, uh, just just two points very quickly? I think I think I agree with with all that uh, both Helen and, and John just said. Um, uh, in, in in the talks that I've had with some of the NHS clinical engineers, uh, they, they were you know they they were basically saying that the uh, the exclusive dependence of OEMs for parts uh, turned extortionate price for spare parts into the law of the land, right? And 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 this this. Very high prices for you know mentioned about software. We're talking about training, but also spare parts. This is paid by us. This is paid by in full by the taxpayer. And um, um, just commenting on, on on the hardware side of things, and uh, two two very quick points. Um, um, an NHS hospital in the north of England two weeks ago was quoted forty thousand pounds for three. 
printed circuit boards. Okay, forty thousand pounds for three printed circuit boards by the OEM, so that they could have a critical equipment repaired. And and we all know, everyone who's got some experience with repair here knows that those those PCBs, and I've seen the pictures of the PCBs. Those PCBs could be repaired for probably you know less than a thousand pounds, including the you know someone's time and, and parts and everything else. So this is one one example of something that is happening now. If Biomed, uh, biomedical uh, engineers were given the tools and the training, they could be saving the NHS a lot of money, okay, and do so a lot more quickly. Um, and, and the other example is another um, um, NHS hospital had a ventilator down because the power supply failed. So the technician, the engineer, went to the uh, OEM and the OEM said, well, it's going to take eight months before I can get you any parts because of the existing situation. And we are, we were in the process of redesigning the power supply. Therefore, we can't get any parts for you in less than eight months. Okay, that power supply in that case was about 1500 pounds, roughly, according to the, uh, the biomed engineer. And what he did is said, you know what, we need to get this going. So he went yeah, and, and bend, you know, you had to uh, bend the rules a bit and using a multimeter and, you know, power supply, etc. So he did a bit of a troubleshooting down to the PCB level and he found uh, a faulty relay. And, I, and he replaced that relay and the power supply is not working. And I asked, so how much did you pay for that, that relay? So, oh, it was less than a pound. Okay. So, so he resolved the situation there and then very quickly using his technical abilities the, the very limited you know access to tools and and and, and, and everything else that, that he had and he got that going and this is precisely what we think should be happening right now and not just for ventilators it's for you know anesthetic equipment x-rays and beds and everything else and so i just just wanted to um, to add that those comments thanks. okay very quickly thank thanks you. thanks william and just to clarify for our listeners what the technician did in that case of fixing it himself would have actually made that piece of equipment no longer certified as safe to be used in medical uh, environment question well i think it was one of the points that uh, matt letcher uh, made earlier on you know these these um, you know power supplies don't really affect how um, uh, a ventilator works, but I don't know if John or Helen have any. Yes, I, I, I'd like to add a comment to that. So most clinical engineering departments, or EBME departments, they have a quality management system. And it's very simple for the manager of that system to put in a certification system. I've done it myself, where, for example, using your power supply example, I had a very similar uh, issue with a power supply and a company, I won't name the company, wanted an exorbitant amount of money for a new power supply, whereas um, it just needed a transformer. Uh, it was a 15 pound transformer available from RS components. And I told my technician, change the transformer, put the power supply back and do something. He said, well, it's not, it's not that manufacturer's power, um, transformer because the transformer on the circuit board was labeled with their label. I said, I don't care. You can buy exactly the same transformer from RS components, buy it, put it in, and I will give a certificate myself as a chartered engineer to say that this is suitable for use in this power supply. And that's a perfectly legal thing to do. I'm sure Jim will agree with me. Okay, that's that's reassuring because we hear of some of the limitations uh, and uh, red tape around these issues. And I, so think, I think, Hugo, a lot of people add to the red tape by making things up in their own heads. There, there is no reason why you can't replace a transformer for exactly the same transformer that's broken down. No reason at all. As long as, you are a, as long as you're a qualified engineer and you understand what you're doing, um, and if you want to, you can get it certified by your boss or your boss's boss. Uh, I've stopped people um, because, uh, because of exorbitant um, planned maintenance schedules within books, which manufacturers have put together. I've stopped people doing multiple steps within the servicing because they're unnecessary. Like, uh, you know, checking the EEPROM. Why are you checking the EEPROM? A nurse is not going to get into the EEPROM. It says so in the service manual. I don't care. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> it'll save half an hour off the job. 
I don't want you to do it. So I, I think it, there are some engineering decisions to be made by engineers and not to be afraid to make those decisions. As long as you document it and you do a risk assessment, there's no reason why you can't be more efficient, be more lean. And I'm a, I'm a keen advocate of working, working lean. Yeah, I would back John up on that any day of the week. Um, yeah, the, you know, it, the I apologise for my dog barking in the background. Um, no problem, don't worry about the, it. Um, you know, we, we, we are trained engineers. We are certified to be able to do these things. We have CNG, ING, ENG tech qualifications um, that, that give us um, the ability to be able to make these sort of decisions by, and as John rightly says, by having the, quite, uh, the right QC, uh, QA programs in place, there is no reason why those simple sorts of things can be not undertaken by the engineers. I think there has become a, um, um, a perception across uh, engineering uh, to, to not risk to not put oneself at risk uh, from those uh, legal situations. And um, I think that's something that really we, we have to address, um, that it has to be, um, you know, a, we have to focus on, on what we can do and what we can achieve um, and, and do that by the book. Um, and I think there's, there's this um, perception that, you know, we, we're going to put ourselves in a legal bind if we, if we don't do that. Um, but I think I think now I think the engineering community is beginning to realise that um, they don't need to work that way, that they can um, make sure that the processes that they put in place uh, are adequate for um, for servicing these pieces of equipment. I, I mean, just a quick thing. I, I mean, I, I'm not uh, able to kind of comment on the on the specifics of, 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 of sort of those sorts of repairs. What's what's been said sounds completely reasonable to me but uh, you know nevertheless not not my field what i would um ask though is do the vendors try to dissuade people through contract rather than law you know you you, you interfere with this piece of equipment and you void my warranty uh there's a you know there's a supply contract for maintenance and if you you know start poking about with it then uh you know the, i'm never going to touch the machine again and that's your investment down the pan uh yes they do do that uh, but um, the fact is, is that they will come in. I, I, I've um, had this argument with many different manufacturers. And the, the, the reality is, um, I'll give you one example. Uh, I had a, a company that was servicing ultrasound machines in one of the hospitals I looked after. And they were charging £5,000 per machine. And I went and shouted one of their engineers. And I had about probably 15 of these machines in the hospital. And they would only give us a comprehensive contract. So I watched what he did. He took a little uh, a little filter out the back of the machine, cleaned it, put it back in, and did an electrical safety test, and then did a test with a Phantom. So I found out how much the Phantom was. Uh, it was like 500 quid. Uh, I found out where to get these filters from. Uh, not, ex not from the manufacturer, but an alternative s source. And then I wrote a work instruction, and I got one of my own technicians to go and do the work, and I canceled the contracts. And they told me, you can't do that. But actually, I did do it. And it saved the trust £30,000 a year. And actually, their, their equipment was one of the most reliable um, uh, ultrasound machines that, that is around. And I said to them, look, if you charge me a reasonable price, I would probably still have you doing the maintenance. Because I said, well, you won't get the software upgrades. I said, well, the clinicians are not moaning about the software. It works perfectly well. So um, when I want a software upgrade, I'll pay for it. I said, well, we won't do a software upgrade unless you have a service contract with us. I said, well, you know, we'll take we'll we'll take that as it you know, as it comes. So they do do this sort of thing. But coming back to that same story, after a year, I had a phone call from their managing director saying, we'd be willing to to have a contract with you just to come out and do a PPM because before we used to have a comprehensive contract with you, we'll charge you two hundred and eighty eight pounds per machine. So from, from 5,000 pounds down to 208, and we'll give you the software upgrades, which I took that contract out uh, because that was worth it. And so you can, you can, and even then they were making a reasonable profit on it, I thought. <laughs> so, uh, so you can actually twist the arms of these providers. But I think as uh, Helen was saying, most clinical engineers seem to be risk averse. You just need to say why you're doing it and, and make sure you're doing things which are safe. 
Excellent. Thanks so much for this. Uh, I have one final question. I know we're running a little behind. Um, so what about the issue of ongoing maintenance of this new equipment that's been quickly designed and turned around now uh, in the case of this emergency? Will the companies making CPAP devices such as Mercedes Formula One open up service documentation and diagnostic tools for this effort? And will there be spare parts? Or are, is anyone thinking about these issues, even in terms of procurement? Uh, maybe John wants to say something on this, but um, this is speculation, but I would probably suspect not. Um, I would think that some of this equipment will, will probably be almost one shot. And if it does break down, then, They'll just they'll just get another one out of stock and and use that. Um, I think the the numbers that are being quoted as being built in such a short space of time um, are not necessarily all going to be used, um, and therefore I, I suspect that that you know some of this equipment will just um, will be used, and if it fails, that they'll they'll just replace it with another piece. That's speculation. Um, you know, it would be nice to think that they that there are proper uh, documentation and everything else in place. But um, with the speed of the turnaround of, of them building these pieces of equipment, um, I, th there is a worry in the back of my mind that some of those things may have been missed. But it's very difficult to say at this point. I, I agree with you, Helen. I think for the majority of the devices that, that these big manufacturers are now making, the quick manufacture of these CPAP machines, um, they'll they'll effectively be disposable um, because they're brand new. Um, they'll 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 get a quick functional test, possibly a quick electrical test as they come out the box and then go on to the patient. If they break down, they'll probably go back into a box and possibly go back to the manufacturer or be put in a corner for repair. But there'll be probably many more there waiting to go on to the patient. Uh, I think that there are going to be tiered uh, tiered um, levels of care terms of there'll all be intensive care patients going into these field hospitals but the level of the equipment won't all be intensive care level and um, probably the top five percent of ventilators will be really um, you know the most complex types of ventilators G Penlon those types of very high level ventilators but the majority of the ventilators on the patients will be relatively simple and with probably not 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 very uh, difficult to repair so I, I can't see it being being a problem. I also think that companies like uh, uh, Mercedes will, will give service documentation and will uh, will have spare parts available if they're required. But from what I understand about the CPAP machine that Dyson are making, it's basically a fan in a box. Um, uh, so it's it's producing air pressure keep the lungs at a certain level of pressure to make it easier to breathe in for the patient. That's about all, all those machines will do. And, and that's pr probably all that they need them to do. Thanks, uh, John and Helen. Uh, worrying, uh, given the context of the shortage of this equipment globally, and so if we take the UK out of the picture for a moment, and um, we should probably think about how we can advocate for spare parts and repair yes. documentation to be available I do. a global sense for all of this. Mm. Um, a quick comment. It's... Yeah, please. Yeah. Go. Um, so just a, the, in Europe, the procurement um, process did involve quite a lot of documentation about what the manufacturers were to provide them as the designs that they were to, to use, I believe. Um, that was quite interesting because you know the presumably the point there was standardization and, and, and to easily manufacturers into uh, producing things that that, that Euro the European authorities believe was usable I wonder if that you know whether people have got more information about about that because that might well impact these questions make things more uh, repairable reusable um, and all of the rest of it Yeah, um, good questions. I I think um, if no one has an immediate comment, uh, I would like us to, well, we can think about how the current work on right to repair might act happening at European and US level can actually 
be extended looking forward to uh, going forward to medical equipment. And this is a big piece of work to think about. But meanwhile, I think it's time to wrap up. And um, I'd like to ask William, maybe, if you'd like to have some final remarks from our side. Yes, very, very briefly. Uh, we, we've been, you know, we've been discussing for the last hour or so about, you know, very important subjects that I, I really hope will be uh, some something something positive can be produced out of this discussion. Uh, we we as a, as an organisation we we're not we're not only engaging with the uh, NHS in the UK. We are engaging with you know equivalent organisations in other countries, and we're seeing some great initiatives. Places like Brazil, where car makers are not turning to uh, shifting their production to making more ventilators, but they are actually focusing on repairing repairing maintenance because of the time scales repairing maintenance means you can increase capacity faster compared to a building a new designing and building a new ventilator from scratch i think it's very important that uh, we try as much as possible to focus on not reinvent, reinventing the wheel type of thing and re-engaging with um, you know energy companies in california you've seen on you know on social media over the weekends and uh, and, and these are interesting projects. We spoke yesterday, I was speaking to a, a, a Minister of Health in Peru over there. As John was saying, you know, we're quite a rich country. We can, you know, can afford to buy ventilators and probably have more than we were going to need. In, in Peru, they have just over 1,500 ventilators for a population of 32 million people. And I spoke to the director of asset maintenance and, 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 and commissioning uh, there and equipment commissioning, and they are desperate. They're desperate because they only have 1,500 ventilators. 30% of them are faulty and they're looking to repair and maintain those as quickly as possible. And we know that there are lots of, um, you know, more systems hidden and in, in, in storage is here and they, they, they're likely to develop faults and they could be checked, they could be recommissioned. Uh, a trust in the north of England, after reading some of my articles that I published a couple of weeks ago, they went on, checked the storage, they found 30 ventilators, work, you know, 24 seven for a number of days with the manufacturer and managed to bring those back you know to the front line so um i think i think you know this this sums up where where we are as an organization i think every effort to save lives you know must keep this in mind you know the people who do this critical work must be listened to as well i think it's very important yeah they they the people who are on the ground um uh, they they need to be taken into consideration okay and uh, you know finally when when this is all over i would expect that our country's emergency preparedness plan we will have been updated to make electronic repair and maintenance a key subject in vocational college and university in university engineering courses as well you know we must have more skilled people ready to help maintain all critical equipment during a crisis these people need to be well paid and listened to and uh, and they also need to be listed as key workers for providing an essential service to the country. Thank you. Thank, thanks, William. And uh, I'd like to add a couple of notes. First, uh, from our side, uh, biomeds need to know that they have our backing, not just financial, but also protection from the lawsuits that they might be brought into when they perform repairs, when they are in breach of some of these service contracts and when they have to make critical decisions in order to save lives. It sounds like a, a real sea change is going to happen in the profession going forward. We, we're really happy to hear from John and Helen and their work and their experience can really provide leadership in this field. And more broadly, I think this has been a really useful conversation uh, to to get us to think a bit differently about some of the challenges and the opportunities to improve uh, the way we look at these issues and how we can shift the thinking to on repairability of products and what does it mean to provide uh, ongoing long long term support to products and what are the barriers and the opportunities and I'd like to thank all of our panelists to take the time of this moment of crisis to join us and to answer these questions. I think there will be a lot of thinking and hopefully we've made some initial good connections. And thanks to 
all of you. And uh, if any of you has information to share uh, with iFixit on this wonderful database they're creating, please uh, go on their website and contribute to it. And uh, the big question remain, are we ready? And hopefully we got some reassurance in the last hour. The next couple of weeks and the months ahead are critical and will reveal the answer. And we hope indeed that it be positive. Thank you, everyone.